morning, Atlantis. It sure came early, but good morning. At least it seems early. Came early for us, too. Excellent burn, Atlantis. Nice afterburners. Yeah, we appreciated the KU peak. It was vivid down here, too. Floating into view in this uh, live television picture from the flight deck of Atlantis, Commander Jim Weatherby, now in his fourth flight into space. Weatherby's last mission more than two years ago aboard Discovery on the STS-63 mission was the first uh, rendezvous uh, with the Mir space station in which uh, Weatherby guided uh, Discovery to within 37 feet of the Mir in a practice, a dress rehearsal, if you will, uh, for the eventual uh, initial docking of the shuttle to the Mir uh, two months uh, or several months later by um, uh, Commander Hoot Gibson. Uh, he, there is uh, pilot Mike Bloomfield uh, about to make his way down into the mid-deck of Atlantis as the astronauts continue to set up equipment in preparation for the day's activities. Okay, it's tough to figure out how to get all seven of us up here on the aft flight deck, uh, but it was even tougher to get all seven of us down in the mid-deck after launch yesterday when we had all the equipment down there trying to recover after a great launch and a very short flight day one to stow everything. It was amazing. The troops here did a great job. I was very impressed with Bloomer, our rookie on ascent. It was an incredible ride. He did, he did a great job. He had a couple of uh, minor failures right off the launch pad, uh, which didn't amount to much, but it does cause us to uh, really get our brains flowing if they weren't flowing right at liftoff, and he did a great job. Uh, identifying the failures and deciding what to do about it, which was basically nothing because Atlantis is such a great ship. It turned out there were just uh, deucer problems and, and minor anomalies, but it was a great ride. I didn't look outside the window very much on my fourth flight. Bloomer looked out only a couple of times because he was really doing his systems work. He saw a couple of interesting things uh, around SRB SEP. Uh, it really pushes you. It's unbelievable that we're not halfway to Mars after the main engines quit. Uh, and it was uh, thanks to all the people who worked on the flow for Atlantis. It is a great vehicle. Uh, we got right to the orbit that we wanted to. So we're on our way to Mir, which we should be there by tomorrow. Uh, a couple of burns today to improve our orbits and get closer. And basically today we're just in the catch-up mode trying to pack everything. Uh, that was out for launch and get set up for the rendezvous tomorrow. Uh, I'll say that all of the crew members I'm very happy with, very impressed with, they're just charging around, doing things, and, and getting things sorted out. Uh, everyone pretty much working standalone today will work as a team tomorrow. Everyone coordinated. Uh, today we're all relatively separate. Uh, once again, thanks to the Ascent team and the folks who worked on the processing of the vehicle, and I'll turn it over to Scott now. 
Well, I'd just like to echo uh, what Jim said. Uh, thanks to all the great troops that uh, made all this possible. It was uh, really the, the greatest uh, ride of my life, a uh, real e-ticket ride. And uh, we're all uh, very busy on our, our first flight day, but uh, things are really coming together for the crew. And I'd just like to point out in this picture that uh, Too Short Lawrence is really taller than I am in space. I guess uh, everybody always wants to know, are you nervous on the launch pad? And uh, oddly enough, we're busy enough or thinking about enough that we're not usually. But in the last 15, 30 seconds, you start start thinking about it. And oh, with Wex, Bloomer, Scott, and Bob Lodi up here, uh, literally I just thought about these guys that are just incredibly all pro at this. And this is what professional astronauts are all about, is uh, pulling this off safely because... When those solids go, really when the engines start gimbling on the ground and the vehicle starts shaking around, and you, uh, you know there's a lot of moving parts here under G in a suit, and I just thought about those guys up there, and you really feel safe. So uh, these guys are just the best there are, and you should see them up here moving also. It's, uh, it's impressive, so thanks. Uh, as a rookie, it was uh, pretty impressive, uh, the uh, launch. The most impressive thing is it started out dark as we're sitting on the pad, but all the way uphill, um, it was basically daylight from the, uh, the fire behind us pushing us up in. And right at SRB step, you can see the SRBs come off, and it's a very, very impressive show. I hope it looked just as neat on the ground, and it's great to be up here with a great crew that are uh, making life easy for me. One new experience for me on my fourth flight, this is the first time I've had the double space hab module and I did get to float down the tunnel past the uh, volumes that were going to dock with Mir and it's a pretty long way so it was awfully fun floating down there uh, the length of the tunnel. We hope to have more of these uh, short visits with you where we get everybody up on camera and thanks a lot and it's time for us to go back to work. Uh, Dr. David Wolf, I think it would be an understatement to say that the the whole world is watching and is very concerned about you going aboard the Mir. Uh, are you the least bit concerned about going on Mir? Well, you have to always take space flight seriously, and uh, we're, I'm concerned as I would be in any other space flight. But the Mir is in excellent condition to my mind, and uh, I'm looking forward to being over there. Um, uh, I noticed from your uh, resume that you're a stunt pilot. How would this mission compare being on Mir with your stunt piloting experiences? Well, I don't do stunts. I do aerobatics, and uh, which are I don't consider that particularly dangerous as long as you do it carefully and don't cross the line. And that's how I plan to conduct this mission also in a conservative fashion and. Uh, We'll do it very safely. Uh, Commander Lawrence, besides dropping off David Wolf and picking up Michael Fole, uh, you're delivering some much-needed supplies to the Mir, including a new computer and drinking water. Um, Atlantis is supposed to dock with Mir tomorrow. What happens if the Mir's computer goes out before the shuttle docks with it? I'm going to pass that one off to the commander since he's been training uh, for that scenario right up until launch. Okay. Uh, I'll also say that we do have uh, a long tunnel between our living quarters here and the space hab, and, and I do stunts going down there. In between, when I'm trying to get from one place to another, we love to do rolls and flips as we're translating. That's where we do our stunts in between uh, modules. If they lose their computer before we dock, we will separate it for a safe distance away and allow them to reboot the computer. They've been successful in doing that. They've practiced that technique over the past couple of weeks, and they are very good at rebooting it now and getting it back up to speed. Mir will regain control capability, and then we will dock uh, maybe the next day. If they lose it in close, we can continue the rendezvous and the docking manually, and uh, Scott and Mike just uh, matched the rates that we have with the Mir, and then I, I continue.
continue to dock in Volodya continues to take ranging measurements with a, uh, a laser gun that's similar to a police laser uh, for ranging information. So either way, if it doesn't fail, we'll have a successful docking, hopefully. If it does, then they can reboot it. Uh, Commander Lawrence, give us an idea of some of the supplies that you're going to be carrying up to Mir. In addition to computer for the mirror and water for the mirror, we're taking over a, a gyrodyne, which will also uh, improve the motion control system. Uh, we're also taking over a great deal of scientific hardware that David will need to complete his mission. Uh, the experiments are in a wide range of disciplines. He will be doing some uh, experiments that will help us better understand how the human body functions in weightlessness over long periods of time, specifically studying the loss of calcium, which is very important uh, because it's very applicable to patients who are bedridden for a long period of time. We're also going to continue a series of protein crystal growth experiments. We have a handful of experiments that we will be transferring once we docked, and then we also have a, a very interesting experiment. In fact, David has participated in this field for many years. We are going to be growing some tissues on board, some cancer tissues that we hope in the long run will help us better understand that disease and find a cure for it. So there's a, a great, great number of experiments that are going over, an even larger amount of hardware for MIR and uh, other, uh, of course, food and uh, personal equipment for day. But we're going to be very, very busy transferring about 7,000 pounds of equipment. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, David Wolf, uh, do you anticipate doing uh, spacewalks while you're there trying to find the leak in the mirror? I sure would like to. Uh, we have uh, trained extensively for both a, a group of scientific spacewalks and uh, to to repair do repair work in various scenarios, but uh, we'll have to watch that as it unfolds. Of course, we have Pavel and Anatoly who are up there and extremely capable cosmonauts, so I'll be happy to help them from inside also. Do you think that the problems with the Mir have been blown out of proportion? David, well, not in the minds of uh, those of us working in the space program, both the Americans and the Russians, because we don't think that they're out of proportion. We don't think that they're big failures. Some of them, of course, were. Uh, the fire was uh, very dangerous for about... Uh, several minutes, but once it was taken care of, then there there is no more danger. And the and the decompression, of course, was a, a short-term event. But after they isolated the leak within about three minutes, doing a, a, a great job as a crew, uh, then the danger has passed. And so we go about our business to try to fix problems and, and ensure that they don't happen again. We don't dwell on the failures, other than to make sure that uh, we do everything we can to. Uh, make sure that they don't happen again and we improve our redundancy in the future design of the International Space Station. They may be blown out of proportion in other people's minds, but those of us working in the program uh, don't really see it that way. Okay, Bill, we're ready. And in fact, in case you guys are wondering what these big blocks are floating around here, these are pieces of the ergometer, which we're uh, kind of in the process of setting up while we're doing other things. Hey, copy, Dave. We're two minutes to the ZOE. And we'll pick you back up at 1833. Uh, now, having gotten that out of the way, um, let's see what we see. It looks like you have is uh, the balanced, unbalanced. Uh, you got a free-floating cable coming out of one end. Now, is one of the ends at the other end of the cable connected to the P-dip? Yes, the end connected. These two join together and go back to a white cable to the P-dip. One says, the, the open one says TV-IP video cable, and the other one is a downlink balanced unbalanced TV video cable. And uh, Dave, uh, do you know, uh, have you uh, located the actual SSV box itself? No, I haven't. Yeah, that's a completely separate box. It's got a number of LEDs on it. Uh, it should uh, be powered. Uh, it's got a DC utility uh, power cable or a PGSC power cable that goes into it. The other cable uh, to that box also comes out of the P-DIP panel. 
out of the J107 port. Just found it, Bill. Got it here. Thanks. And Houston will ship it to you now. Let us know if you got it. And we've got it. Okay, what you see, of course, is uh, my navigator, Scott Parazinski, on the left side in the foreground of the camera, closest to the camera, and Vladimir Titov sitting on the right side, aft in the cockpit, closest to the camera, Mike Bloomfield in the pilot seat up on the right, and I'm in the left side. You can see the checklist in front with the xenon lamps illuminating a portion of Mike's checklist, of course, the three CRTs. I think we've already had the access arm retract, and here comes main engine ignition, and then six seconds later, you'll see SRB ignition. Notice the light show and the violence as we go uphill. I don't recall, I don't remember it being uh, this much vibration because we are concentrating, of course, on engine parameters and the roll program, etc. And other systems things. You see us going through the displays, looking at the uh, the high sensor that we had on the fuel cell. Of course, monitoring first stage uh, steering performance, which was a new thing on this flight where we had first stage guidance for steering. Which, of course, worked as advertised. You can see a light show out the front windows uh, as we get higher into the thinner atmosphere. The plume expands, and uh, we're still traveling around in a cloud of stuff that gets illuminated in front of us, and you see that out the window. It pretty much is like daytime, even though, of course, we lost at 10.34 in the night. You see the seats vibrating as we go uphill. Uh, starts out about 1G vertical acceleration at liftoff, builds to about 3Gs after two minutes. Mike pointing out and analyzing the, uh, the failure that we had with the sensor, and then we also had the other uh, anomalous water spray boiler sensor indication. We looked at that briefly. And, of course, monitoring engine parameters on CRT2, the upper right cathode ray tube. And here we are getting ready for SRB separation, and notice the light show that you see here. It's pretty incredible. The solids are separated with uh, rockets uh, on the side of each solid that pushes the solid rocket boosters away from the vehicle so that we can continue to accelerate uphill using the fuel in the external tank and the three main engines. The solids uh, are separated, jettisoned, and, and uh, parachutes open, and they're dropped into the Atlantic Ocean, uh, picked up with ships, and refurbished. After SRB SEP, We turn off our oxygen and raise our visors. As we approach Mach 25, Mike is concentrating more and more on the engines, and there's main engine cutoff, and you see we instantly decelerate to zero times the force of gravity, and we're immediately weightless. Within a few seconds, the external tank uh, drops off of the vehicle, and it chops into the ocean, and there are the jets firing and the pyrotechnics that separate the external tank. We are traveling at orbital speed in our cloud of uh, residue from the jets, and, and as the jets fire for attitude control, you can see them, uh, the light bouncing off of the haze that's around us, and it, it flashes. Mike uh, had a pretty good initiation into the space flight business on his first flight with the two failures right off the launch pad, which uh, were relatively minor, but yet the master alarm rings and, and it gets your attention. Right at external tank separation, he had his third failure, uh, manifold left 3D, uh, a jet on the left side of the vehicle, the third manifold that is pointed in the down direction that helps the tail go up if we fire that jet. 
uh, failed. And that rings the uh, caution and warning system, and uh, I analyzed that correctly. And uh, one of the things the vehicle does is uh, dump the residual propellant from the vehicle out through the main engines, and that takes a couple of minutes uh, after main engine cutoff. And it is slightly propulsive, even though the propellant is not ignited or on fire as it comes out of the vehicle, it, it is mass flow, and so it does accelerate us a little bit faster. It also wants to cause the vehicle to, to uh, change its attitude or pitch a little bit, and so the jets are firing here, and you see them, again, flashing every time the jet fires to maintain proper attitude of the vehicle, which, by the way, is upside down relative to the Earth, uh, but we don't uh, think about that at all, especially if we're not looking out the window and seeing the Earth.